listening to VOA One, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn. And Alice Bryant. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. Indonesia has decided to give COVID 19 vaccinations to working age adults before older citizens. The plans differ from vaccination programs in countries such as the United States and Britain, which give priority to older individuals who face a higher risk of death from the disease. Indonesia's program aims to vaccinate adults 18 to 59 after health care workers and public servants. The government hopes the program will help the population reach herd immunity faster and improve the country's economy. The Mayo Clinic notes that herd immunity happens when a large percentage of a community, the herd, becomes immune to a disease, making the spread from person to person unlikely. As a result, the whole community becomes protected, not just those who are immune. Indonesia plans to begin its program with a vaccine developed by China's Sinovac Biotech. Health officials say they do not yet have enough information on the effectiveness of the vaccine on older people. Trials carried out in Indonesia have involved people aged 18 to 59. Health Ministry official Siti Nadia Tarmizi told the Reuters news agency the government will wait for guidance from the country's drug regulators before deciding on vaccination plans for older individuals. Britain and the United States began their vaccination programs with a shot developed by Pfizer BioNTech that showed a high rate of effectiveness in people of all ages. So far, Indonesia has only been able to secure the Sinovac vaccine. The Southeast Asian nation has a deal to receive 125.5 million doses of Sinovac's Coronavac shot. A first shipment of 3 million doses has already arrived. The first doses of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine are not expected to arrive in Indonesia until the third quarter. A vaccine developed by AstraZeneca and Oxford University is expected to be released in the second quarter. Peter Cunningham is a professor of infectious diseases at Australian National University. He said that while Indonesia's vaccination plans could slow spread of the disease, it may not affect death rates. But Colin Young noted that because Indonesia's vaccination program is different from the U.S. and Europe, it can be very valuable. Because it will tell us whether you'll see a more dramatic effect in Indonesia than Europe or the U.S. because of the strategy they're doing, he said. Professor Dale Fisher is with the Yang Lu Lin School of Medicine 
at the National University of Singapore. He told Reuters he understands the reasoning behind Indonesia's plans. Younger working adults are generally more active, more social, and travel more, so this strategy should decrease community transmission faster than vaccinating older individuals, Fisher said. Government officials hope the strategy of vaccinating more socially and economically active individuals can quickly lead to herd immunity. Indonesia's health minister has said the country needs to vaccinate 181.5 million people, or about 67 percent of its population, to reach herd immunity. The government believes this would require almost 427 million doses of vaccines. Some experts question whether the plan could quickly lead to herd immunity. They say more research is needed to find out whether or not vaccinated people can pass on the virus. I'm Brian Lynn. Today, we begin the program with a short listening exercise. Pay attention for two verbs connected to giving advice. If you are like me, you may not have had a real haircut since the pandemic began. But a friend just recommended a hair salon on 17th Street. She also suggested I call for an appointment at least one month before the desired date. Did you catch the two verbs related to advice giving? They are recommend and suggest. In English, there are several verbs that carry the meaning of advice. On today's program, we will talk about three of them. The verbs advise, suggest, and recommend are close in meaning, but there are some differences. However, these verbs share a few sentence patterns. Let me begin by talking about differences between the meanings and uses. The verb advise is the most formal of the three and is usually used when someone with authority or expertise gives a strong suggestion. It could come from a government official, for example, or a work supervisor, a doctor, or someone else. Its noun form, advice, does not carry the same usage rule. Anyone can offer advice to anyone else. The verb recommend is less formal than advise and more personal. It is usually used when someone is making a suggestion based on his or her personal experience. Friends, family, and co-workers, for example, often recommend things to each other. Even a friendly stranger can recommend something based on experience. Suggest is the least formal of the three verbs. We use this verb in many situations to offer an idea, opinion, or possible plan of action for someone to consider. Note that in common everyday English, the verbs suggest and recommend are sometimes used interchangeably. Now, let's do a quick self-test to see how much we know about sentence patterns. I will give you three sentences. You decide which ones use correct grammar. Here they are. My dad suggested that I speak with my doctor. 
She recommended to me a documentary film. The teacher advised you should study more. Did you decide which sentences are correct? The only correct answer is, my dad suggested that I speak with my doctor. If you are unclear about why it's correct, do not worry. Even highly experienced English learners can find the patterns tricky. Now, let's jump into the grammar. The verbs advise, suggest, and recommend can follow many sentence patterns. Today, we will focus on a few patterns they have in common. Each verb can be followed by a noun phrase, a that clause, or a gerund. The first pattern is verb plus noun phrase. A noun phrase is a group of words in a sentence that act as a subject or object. Noun phrases that follow the verbs advise, recommend, and suggest act as sentence objects. Listen to an example to find out what I mean. Pay attention to the verb and the noun phrase that follows. My doctor advises 30 minutes of cardio per day. Here, the noun phrase after advises is 30 minutes of cardio. Can you recommend a good restaurant in town? Did you find the noun phrase after recommend? It is a good restaurant. May I suggest this natural pet food? Did you catch the noun phrase? It is this natural pet food. Sometimes we want to name the person who receives the suggestion. When we do this, we often follow the noun phrase with to plus person. Listen to an example which corrects a sentence from the short test earlier. She recommended a documentary film to me. The noun phrase here is a documentary film. Notice that to me comes after, not before, the noun phrase to show who received the suggestion. The verbs advise, suggest, and recommend can also be followed by that clauses. A clause is a part of a sentence with its own subject and verb. That clauses begin with the word that and are noun clauses. Listen to some examples. Notice that each of our verbs of advice is followed by a that clause. Tony suggests that we hit the road by 6 in the morning. Our boss advised that the team finish the work before the holiday. I recommend that you bring warmer clothing. It can get really cold there at night. There are two things to know about using that clauses with these verbs. The first is that the basic form of the verb must be used in the that clause. The basic forms in the examples are hit, finish, and bring. The second is we can leave out the word that in noun clauses especially in everyday speech and writing. For example, there is no difference in meaning between I recommend that you bring warmer clothing and I recommend you bring warmer clothing. And finally, the verbs advise, suggest, and recommend can be followed by gerunds. Some of you may remember that a gerund is the ing form of a verb and acts as a noun. 
Listen to these examples and notice that each verb is followed by a gerund. I suggest taking a walk after lunch. Our lawyers advised against speaking to the media. We recommend going to the park on weekdays. Did you find the gerunds? They are taking, speaking, and going. Notice that we use the preposition against when we are expressing a negative meaning of advise. Well, that's our program for today. I recommend that you come back next week for another grammar lesson. I'm Alice Bryant. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. June 18, 1910, was an exciting day for Theodore Roosevelt. It was the day that the former American president returned from a long trip to Africa and Europe. Hundreds of thousands of people gathered in New York City to welcome him home. There were speeches and bands and a parade. Frank Oliver and Tony Riggs tell us about Teddy Roosevelt's trip. They also tell us how political problems hurt his friendship with President William Howard Taft. It was the perfect end to a trip that began three weeks after Theodore Roosevelt completed his presidency. Most of the trip was a huge success. In Africa, Theodore Roosevelt spent months hunting wild animals. He shot many lions, elephants, and other animals. He brought all of them back and gave them to the Smithsonian Institution. After hunting in Africa, he and his wife Edith went to Europe. The Roosevelts visited Italy and met the king and queen. They visited Vienna and met the ruler of Austria and Hungary. In Germany, they met Kaiser Wilhelm II. Kaiser Wilhelm invited the former American president to watch a big parade of German troops. He told him, You are the first civilian who has ever joined the Kaiser in reviewing the troops of Germany. The two men were photographed shaking hands. On the back of the photograph, the Kaiser wrote, When we shake hands, we shake the world. The Roosevelts met the kings and queens of Norway, Belgium, and the Netherlands. They met the crown princes of Sweden and Denmark. And while in England, Mr. Roosevelt served as America's official representative at the funeral of King Edward VII. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt made a number of speeches at several universities, including Oxford and the Sorbonne. Yet all these activities did not keep him from reading newspapers and letters from home. The news troubled him. He had led the Republican Party with great success. Now the party seemed to be falling apart, it had split into two groups. One group included conservatives who supported President William Howard Taft. The other group included progressives who opposed Taft. Theodore Roosevelt had worked hard to get William Howard Taft elected. 
President Taft had been in office a little more than a year. Yet, in that short time, he had broken almost completely with the progressives who had supported Roosevelt. The split developed because progressives expected Taft to rule as Roosevelt had done, with energy and emotion. They wanted a man who could excite people with dreams of social progress. Theodore Roosevelt was such a man. William Howard Taft was not. He was a big, slow-moving man. He refused to make quick decisions. As a former judge, he depended on facts, not emotion, to make decisions. President Taft did much to carry out the reform programs Theodore Roosevelt had begun. But his methods led people to believe that he was really trying to kill the programs. Taft wrote to Roosevelt shortly before the former president sailed for home. I do not know if I have had harder luck than other presidents, he said, but I do know I have succeeded far less than others. I have been trying to carry out your policies, but my method of doing so has not worked smoothly. A few weeks later, Theodore Roosevelt returned home. In his speech to those who welcomed him in New York, he said, I am ready and willing to do my part to help solve America's problems, and these problems must be solved if this country is to reach the high level of its hopes. To President Taft, Roosevelt wrote, I will make no speeches or say anything for two months, but I will keep my mind open as I keep my mouth shut. President Taft invited Theodore Roosevelt to visit him at the White House. Roosevelt said he could not. However, he did meet with many of the progressive opponents of the president. Later, he met with Taft at the president's summer home in Massachusetts. It was not a happy meeting. The two friends were tense. By this time, Roosevelt had decided that he agreed with the progressives. He believed President Taft had turned back many of Roosevelt's policies. Roosevelt decided it was time for him to go to the American people. He accepted an invitation to a celebration in Wyoming. He traveled west by train. He stopped in many towns and cities to make speeches. He spoke of party unity. He tried to heal the split that had weakened the Republican Party. But the policies he proposed were progressive. Conservatives refused to support them. President Taft could not understand Roosevelt's purposes. If I only knew what he wanted, Taft said, I would do it. But he has told me nothing. I am deeply wounded. He gives me no chance to explain my position or to learn his. Theodore Roosevelt hoped his speaking trip would help Republican Party candidates win in the 1910 congressional elections. His efforts seemed to fail. Republicans were defeated in many states. For a year after the party's defeat in the congressional elections, Theodore Roosevelt remained silent. Then, Near the end of 1911, America's political parties began to prepare for the presidential election that would be held the following year. 
Roosevelt was sure Taft could not be re-elected. Taft had become very conservative. He had close ties to business interests. What the people wanted, thought Roosevelt, was a progressive president. What they wanted was a man like himself. So Theodore Roosevelt began to speak out again in opposition to many of the things President Taft was doing. For example, President Taft had proposed treaties with Canada, Britain, and France. Roosevelt criticized them. Taft was troubled. He told a friend, It is very hard to take all these blows from Roosevelt. I do not know what he is trying to do except to make my way more difficult. It is very hard to see a close friendship going to pieces like a rope of sand. By now, it was clear to Taft that Roosevelt wanted to be the presidential candidate of the Republican Party in the election of 1912. Earlier, this would have pleased Taft. He would have been happy to leave the White House. But the situation was different now. Roosevelt had changed. Taft felt that the policies he proposed seemed too extreme. Taft decided it was his duty to oppose Roosevelt and the progressives. He would seek re-election. Taft believed he could win the Republican nomination for president. He still had the support of many party leaders. Four months before the Republican nominating convention opened, several progressive Republican governors appealed to Roosevelt. They urged him to declare himself a candidate for president. Roosevelt, they said, was the man to lead the nation into a new era of social progress. Then Taft made a strong statement against the progressives. They are seeking, he said, to pull down the temple of freedom and representative government. A reporter asked Roosevelt to answer Taft's statement. Roosevelt said, My hat is in the ring. That meant he was a candidate. Now the conflict was in the open, and Roosevelt was ready to fight. In his speeches, Roosevelt criticized Taft bitterly. In a voice shaking with hatred, he said Taft was controlled by conservative politicians. He said Taft stood in the way of progress. He said Taft was disloyal. Taft had to answer. In one speech he said, This tears my soul. I am here to answer an old and true friend who has made many charges. I deny all those charges. I do not want to fight Theodore Roosevelt, but I am going to fight him. After the speech, a reporter looked for the president. He found him sitting alone, his head in his hands. His eyes were filled with tears. Roosevelt was my closest friend, Taft said. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 